Welcome to Off the Page, the show where we talk with Colorado authors to get the story behind the story. I'm Stacy McKenzie, a librarian here at Mamie Dowd Eisenhower Public Library in Broomfield. And today we have Michelle Morris with us today, author of Tasting Colorado. Michelle, thank you so much for being on the show today. Delighted to be here, thanks. And give us the full title of your book. Tasting Colorado, Favorite Recipes from the Centennial State. Oh, we love local cuisine, love to talk about that type of thing. So do I. And w let's back up a little bit. Um, have you always been a chef and been able to cook like this, or how did you come to be a chef? I haven't always been a chef, um, but I've always cooked. I was in the kitchen at a very young age. I was fortunate to have a mom that let me in the kitchen to cook. I always loved to cook. And about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I really got the bug to do something with it full time mm -hmm. and launched a food business eight years ago to teach people how to cook and to do some food writing. And that eventually led to a cookbook. And what really made you decide to write a book on Colorado cooking? You know, today it's really tough to get a cookbook noticed by the public and particularly by publishers unless you're a celebrity or you have a famous restaurant or something like that. And there are so many cookbooks on the market today. Uh, anybody can produce a cookbook, but really getting it to sell in the market is a little bit tough. So I was fortunate to have a publisher who had an idea based on a version of this book that was done in Wyoming called The Taste of Wyoming that had sold successfully and they wanted to do a Colorado book. So they actually came looking for a Colorado author, were referred to me, had seen my food writing in other magazines and on my food blog and liked what they saw, so hired me to do the book. Fabulous, perfect. Um, what makes these Colorado specific recipes? Well, the book is 120 recipes from chefs all over the state of Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and it's meant to be a sort of a culinary love letter to the state and represent the, the best of what the state has to offer. So that's the best of uh, cuisine, the best ingredients, the best mm -hmm. chefs, but also the best venues. So it includes B&Bs and resorts and ranches, as well as hotels and restaurants. So a wide selection of things in the book. And all over the state or Denver Metro? All area? over the state. Okay. There are things from all, uh, you know, virtually all sections of it, things from down in southwest Colorado, things from the ski resorts, all up and down the Front Range, et cetera. So all over the place? All over. However, did you decide which um, places you would draw the recipes from? Well, it was easy on the Front Range because I've been to many of the places and know, uh, you know, a lot of the chefs personally and things like that. But the rest of the state took a bit of research to track down what were the best known B&Bs around the state, what were the top resorts in the, you know, ski towns, for instance, and things like that. In today's day and age, there's a lot of information available, a lot of listings, and with things like TripAdvisor reviews and Yelp reviews, uh -huh. you can see what the public really thinks about uh, places to dine as well. So it wasn't that hard to come up with a list. It was hard to shorten it down and keep it to only 20 recipes, in, 120 recipes in the book. And you probably had the terrible, terrible task of having to go to a lot of these places and try the wonderful <laughs> food and decide what you were going to eat. Was that just a burden? It was a real burden, but somebody <laughs> had to do that, so it might as well have been me. It was really fun. It was really fun to meet the chefs. They couldn't have been kinder in that process. And so when you met a, a chef um, and decided that you wanted their recipe for your book, um, how did that process work? Did you say, I'm gonna, I want to use your recipe? Is there any copyright to recipes involved? Um, it's not really an issue of whether there's copyright or not. Um, the issue is were they willing to share for the book, and I'd say 99.9% .9 of people I talked to were very willing to share. The bigger challenge with chefs is getting them focused and getting the recipe actually out of them, because they're, ah. they're busy running a restaurant or running a B&B &B or whatever it is they're doing. Uh, so that took a little bit of work. The other challenge is the book covers everything from breakfast through to dessert. So I needed to balance that 120 recipes across all six chapters, and I needed to balance the ingredients so I couldn't have 20 bison recipes in the book. So as things started rolling in, I had to be a little more specific with chefs mm -hmm. to say, you know, I really need a side dish that features these kind of ingredients. What do you have that might work for me? And it, it got a little tougher as you got down to the end to make that work. And the, 20, the 120 recipes in the book, they say where you got them, and do they feature the chef that usually makes them? Yes, all the recipes are attributed to the chef that they came from. Uh, many of the uh, head, uh, head notes in the recipes have information about the resort or about the restaurant. There are historical facts sprinkled throughout the book as well that talk about places like um, the Buckhorn Exchange and having the first liquor license in Colorado and things like that. So that's kind of fun, too, to have the historical uh, you know, stuff sprinkled all throughout the book. 
So it's not just a cookbook. It's it's like a food guide. It's, it's like a really a guide. culinary tourism book is what mm -hmm. I call it. And that's part of the reason why it's selling so well, because a lot of the places that are in the book, like hotels and places like the Broadmoor gift shop carry it. And people who come to Colorado to visit love to take it home as a souvenir. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Well, let's jump into talking about recipes in the book. Can you give us one of your favorite recipes for the book? Everyone always asks me for my favorite, uh -huh. and it's sort of like picking your favorite children. I really can't pick one. I will tell you the most decadent recipe in the book, and that's okay. the lobster mac and cheese. That's from Frank Bonanno at uh, Mizuna, and it features one stick of butter per serving. Not per recipe, per serving. <laughs> wow. uh, so it is quite decadent. And a lot of the recipes, because they're from restaurant chefs like that, are decadent like mm -hmm. that. Wherever they are like that, I've usually given um, the reader a way to cut calories and make it a little less decadent. But really, if you're going to make something like that, you might as well go all out and have it. That sounds wonderful. It is terrific. It is um, you've got a couple recipes you brought for us today. I brought a couple things that aren't necessarily from the big famous chefs, because uh -huh. a lot of people know those big famous chefs, but I wanted to highlight really some other aspects of the book. So the cookies that I brought are from Sally Clark. She's at the Holden House B&B down in Colorado Springs. Um, it's a chocolate chip cookie that's kind of an unusual chocolate chip cookie. It took me a long time to understand why it was different. Everybody tastes it and mm -hmm. says, wow, that's really unique. The only thing I can figure is because she has you microwave the brown sugar and butter together before stirring everything as opposed to beating butter and sugar in a mixer like you would a normal cookie. So mm -hmm. they have a very fluffy, dense texture to them and they're really unique. Uh, the recipe in the book actually calls for using white chocolate chips and nuts in it. I left nuts out today in case uh -huh. you had a nut allergy. And also to make a point to people that you can always adjust recipes. It doesn't matter what a cookbook tells you. You can adjust what works for you. So that's the cookie recipe I brought. Um, the chili I brought is actually the winning recipe from a neighborhood chili cook-off that I was asked to judge a couple years ago. And it's one of the more iconic things of Colorado would be a pork green chili recipe. Uh -huh. So it's kind of neat that that's what won the chili cook-off from that year. And it's actually a friend of mine's recipe. I didn't know he was my friend uh -huh. when I was judging the cook-off. And I've adapted a little bit of his recipe to use some fresher ingredients and a few less canned things. But it's pretty much his recipe. So that's what I brought you to try today. I'd love for you to have a sample of that. Well, I would like love to. to. It smells so have a good. Have a bite? You bet. <laughs> It just smells so it's good. It's got a little bit of zip to it because it does have green chilies in it. Okay, so. I'll be prepared for that. Yeah. It does have a little zip, mm -hmm. but it's really good. I yeah. love that. So it's got, is this hominy? It has hominy in it. It's mm. really a pasoli recipe. Uh, it actually has a little bit of beans in it today, just the mm -hmm. way I made it. Mm -hmm. Again, that's what I had on hand when I was cooking it. That's not in the recipe in the book, but the recipe does include uh, hominy for, for making it into pozole. You can leave the hominy out and just have a green chili too. Works and either way. And that's just, the heat is just from the green chilies? Yes. Because it's just a little bit. It's yeah. really nice. There's no cayenne or anything. It's just the, the chilies. You know how they vary in heat every year in Colorado. You never know how spicy they're going to be. And that green chili, I love that flavor of green yeah. chili. Well, let's have dessert. Yeah, go for <laughs> it. I can't keep those cookies around my house when I make them. My husband goes right after them. Okay, and so they're choc normally they have nuts normally and white chocolate? Normally they have both white and chocolate chips in them. I made them today with just chocolate chips, and I left the nuts out. You see, they've got a slightly denser texture than mm -hmm. usually, uh, it, and they keep that nice fluffy shape, which mm -hmm. instead of spreading out flat, even though they're made with butter. Yeah, they're very light, though. Yeah. Yeah, they taste wonderful. Yeah. Mm. They're good, huh? The B&B &B okay, that cool. features them in the spring say they, they keep them out on the counter all the time at the B&B, &B and... They're constantly refilling the jar, so mm. they're quite popular. They're wonderful. Yeah, before the show, we had some staff we had to keep away from them. Yes, we did. So um, you can just tell that, that and they just really look good, too. Yeah. I mean, there's no question that they're, they're going to be good. Thank you so much. Glad to bring them. Oh, my goodness. Michelle, one thing that I always am frustrated with about cookbooks is they have these obscure ingredients, and you're running all over town trying to find them. Are we going to find any recipes in your book that have that issue? Well, one of the things that I made clear to the chefs when I was gathering the recipes is that these had to be recipes that were accessible to a home cook. Mm -hmm. So that means the difficulty of the, the cooking steps involved, the ingredients that are used, the equipment that might be needed, all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, so I selected recipes that would be accessible for home cooks. There are a few recipes that do call for specialty ingredients, but there's a sources section in the book that tells you where you can generally get the mail order or, or special order, that kind of thing, or okay. give you a substitute if it's something that's 
you know, really hard to find. I have to compliment whoever did the photography for your book. Tell us about that process. Well, I, I tell people I may be most proud of the food photography than anything else because mm -hmm. I'm not a trained food photographer. I'm a self-taught food photographer. Mm -hmm. um, I started blogging, um, being a food blogger maybe, well, actually seven years ago today I started blogging. Mm -hmm. And uh, through those years I taught myself how to do food photography because you really need to to attract people to your food blog. So when I first got the contract to do the cookbook, I wasn't supposed to be the photographer. They were going to hire an outside photographer. Mm -hmm. And I asked them for that opportunity and I shot three of the recipes for them and mm -hmm. presented them and then was awarded the photography contract. Um, I tell people that I got that beautiful lighting on that uh, food by shooting in my studio at my home, but I say that jokingly because my studio is really a small corner in the southwest of my family room at home that happens to have a French door on one side and a window on the other mm -hmm. side. And it's just enough natural light and it's just at the right angle in the room and I set up a card table there with my camera on a tripod right there in my family room, and that is my food photography studio. I, I'm just uh, awed that you you took them yourself. Yeah, that's fabulous. To the have other both thing of those is, talents. I don't I don't um, I don't touch up and style the food in my okay. uh, food photographs. Mm -hmm. People who are trained as food stylists and yes. food photographers will do a lot of fake things. You know, using. Crisco instead of ice cream, um, a lot of tricks of the trade when you're mm -hmm. on a set all day long shooting food. But people who grew up doing food photography for a blog, generally you're photographing your food for your dinner that night and blogging about it. So you're not going to make fake food, you're going to shoot your real food. And so I learned to shoot food as real food. So the only thing in the entire book that's touched up at all is that very front cover where it shows the lines on the peaches because I wasn't getting the grill marks I wanted and I had to paint those on with a little ah. bit of soy sauce. But everything else in the book is the actual real food shot the way it is. Wow, so that gives me a little hope <laughs> that when I cook this, when I go home, mine's gonna look more like, more like the picture. Yeah. There's so many fail pictures out there of what it's supposed to look like and what ours look like. But ours, it, yours isn't fake, so ours has a better chance of looking it real. It does, and I had a lot of assistance kind of you know home cooks that love to cook that help me mm -hmm. test my recipes so they were doing a lot of the plating and helping me which should give you some more assurance that a home cook can do it. Uh, Michelle you have three children of your own do they like to cook? You know my uh, boys the two oldest ones really never cooked anything and they're in their 20s now and they're starting to cook but fortunately for both of them they have girlfriends that do cook. <laughs> my daughter uh, went off to school to originally be an engineer and then she switched to business and then she switched to marketing and then she finally went to culinary school. So she uh -huh. graduated last year. She did a stint in New York in a Michelin starred restaurant. She just finished working at Kelly Lycan in Vail. And I don't know that she'll end up in a restaurant long term, but she's a fabulous cook. That's Makes me wonderful. very proud. Oh, that's good. You got one. In I have another one of one her one recipes in the, in the book. <gasps> I snuck in her uh, salsa. It's the tequila lime salsa. Uh, amazingly, I didn't have a salsa recipe from a single Colorado chef, so it was perfect that I could put that in for her. Well, that's fabulous. Yeah. What about for um, people with younger kids? Um, are these recipes uh, kid friendly? Would you suggest uh, supervision, or how would kids work out with this book? You know, I teach kids how to cook as part of my cooking business, and I have kids as young as three years old in the kitchen rolling sushi and using real knives. So I'm a firm believer in letting kids really cook with you and cook real mm -hmm. food as long as there's adult supervision with them. Um, there's a variety of recipes in this book from simple macaroni and cheeses to very elaborate you know, kinds of dishes. And so there's something that will appeal to everyone, including children in the book. Fabulous. So something for everybody. Um, and you mentioned that you offer cooking lessons. Uh, do you offer private cooking lessons? Do you have a group setting? I do both private lessons and small groups. I also lead cooking dinner parties where people cook with me and then sit down and eat the dinner like a normal catered dinner. Um, I'm a trained sommelier and I do food and wine and pairing events. I also do small event catering. So just a wide variety of different food type of events. And when someone comes to one of your classes, should they already have a, a set of skills um, or do you teach the very beginners? I tailor my lessons to whatever the students want to learn. Okay. So for instance, this weekend I'll have eight senior high school boys that want to come learn some dishes to make when they go off to college. So I'm tailoring a very simple basic cooking class for them. I have other people that want to learn family meals. I have people who maybe want to learn Thai food. So mm -hmm. I, I tailor my lessons really specifically and custom to what, what the clients want to learn. And you have taken cooking classes 
all over the world, I learned while talking to you about this. So you really do have a first-hand example of all of these different um, cultural types of cooking. What are some things you could offer someone who wanted to learn? Well, I, I tell most people that you don't have to be an expert in any cuisine to cook that cuisine. Mm -hmm. You just need to know some of the ingredients of that so that if you know that chilies and coconut and basil go together, then you can make some pretty good tasting Thai food. If you know garlic, basil, and tomato goes together, you can make some Italian food. Uh, you don't really have to be a trained chef in that cuisine to make it. And I kind of call it global improv. It's, you know, just learning how to put the right flavors together to, you know, to play around with those things and have fun in the kitchen. Michelle, before you even thought about doing anything having to do with cooking professionally, um, you worked for a pretty big corporation. How did you go from working at this big corporation to setting out to be a chef? Well, I went to work for IBM uh, straight out of college, and I actually worked there for 25 years. Uh, but somehow, towards the end of that 25 years, I was really getting intrigued by food more and more. And even though I had cooked my whole life, I started going to some cooking schools all over the world and, and really felt it was time to do something in the food world. So uh, a little bit wary about stepping down from an executive job into something I had never done before. I actually took a leave of absence from IBM to go test the waters a little bit. And I s launched my business in 2006. And it was busy from day one, teaching cooking lessons and doing cooking dinner parties and things. And I was actually, uh, I was actually at a cooking school in France during that first year and got a call from my then manager at IBM asking me if I would take a package, uh, a severance package, and leave because they were doing some downsizing. So uh, things work out for a reason. That was just fate that it was time for me to go. So I took my package and used that to put it into my business, and I was off and running ever since. So you've actually studied cooking in France. Where else have you studied cooking on location, these exotic locations? I've been to cooking schools in multiple places in Italy, in multiple pace places in France, and I'll tell you a funny story about that in a minute. Great. Uh, in Spain, in Thailand, different places in the U.S., in Mexico. That might be all for now that I can oh. think of, but quite a few different places. Maybe some. So the story some about France, I, I went to the Cordon Bleu, not for, you know, a professional program, but for a recreational cooking class. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine at a French cooking school, they're very French about it, you know, and even though they knew all the students only spoke English, the teacher kept speaking in French and very tall man. And he came over and was sort of yelling at me about something I was doing with my potatoes that I wasn't doing correctly. And... I thought he was telling me to do something with my knife, and so I motioned with my knife what I thought he wanted me to do. And right when I did that, he reached <gasps> under, and I came on down and t cut the back of his hand open. Oh. And uh, I guess to make me feel bad for the rest of the class, he just put a little baby Band-Aid on it and let the blood drip down and walked around through the entire class like that uh, so everyone could see what I did to him. And then at the conclusion, told me I had too much salt in my fricassee. <laughs> So that was my experience in France. Did you, were you able to focus on anything as you went through the rest of that class? You know, I just was there to have fun and make some fun food, and it was a great afternoon, so I really wasn't too concerned by it, except for that small moment when I did it. Yeah. I had a moment of panic. <laughs> Thank goodness. He was fine. He yeah, was fine. he was fine. Um, now, your cooking has also led you to work with an organization yes. um, that helps people learn about cooking and nutrition. Can you tell us a little bit about that? When I started my business, I thought I wanted to take a piece of it and give back to the community in some way. And I actually went to meet with the folks at Johnson Wales about creating a program to in some way give back to the community and teach cooking to people who maybe couldn't afford to have private cooking lessons. And it was there that I found out that an organization already existed to do that called Share Our Strength. And part of Share Our Strength, Share Our Strength's mission is to end childhood hunger in America. That's their overall mission. But part of that organization is called Cooking Matters Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we are the education arm of that mission. So you can't end hunger if you don't teach people how to eat healthy on limited budgets. So we teach nutrition classes and healthy eating classes to families on limited budgets in all sorts of organizations across uh, the metro area, actually across this, the entire state of Colorado. And if someone is interested in bringing your group to their facility or their organization, how might they get in contact? Uh, they can contact me through my website or they can look online for the local uh, Cooking Matters office and contact the office directly and they'll learn all about how to bring the organization in and what the requirements are to have a, a six-week class done for that organization. Because it's so important people don't cook at home because they don't know how. 
And a lot of our clients live in areas where there are food deserts, where they don't really have access mm -hmm. to fresh vegetables. And so part of what we do are grocery store tours also to show them when they have an opportunity to get in a grocery store, mm -hmm. how do they make their food budget stretch? How do they buy things that are in season and cheaper and use their money towards fresh foods and more mm -hmm. wholesome foods than what they might be getting at a corner 7-Eleven or something like that? And, and that term, food desert, that's starting to get into our uh, vocabulary a little bit more. Can you just give us a little bit more expanded definition on what that is? In, in certain urban areas and also in remote country areas, uh, you won't find a big King Supers or even a Walmart grocery store or something like that. What you'll have are little mom and pop kind of stores that are a little corner store, and they just can't carry a wide selection of fresh foods. And so they'll have mostly processed foods, fast food kinds of things, and really very little healthy. Many of them won't even have a fresh vegetable or fruit in them at all, mm -hmm. maybe an apple if you're lucky. And that's really what a food desert is, when that's your primary place to shop and you don't have access to a full selection of healthy foods, whether that's in a remote rural area or an urban area that just is in need of a grocery store. So there's a lot of focus on it across the state, actually across the country, mm -hmm. to try to bring grocery stores and other resources like farmers markets into those food deserts. And I think we do hear about food deserts in, in big metropolises like New York and everything, but it does happen here in Colorado. It does, and we actually have a very big problem with hunger in Colorado that maybe doesn't get seen because it's out in rural areas mm -hmm. that people don't focus on. So it's really imp important work, I think, that Cooking Matters does, and, and I'm proud to be part of it. It's a great organization. Thank you. One thing that I really got out of visiting your website um, was that you are an advocate for eating locally. What does eating locally do for your health and the community? What are some benefits of that? I, I woke up one day, I don't know, maybe five years ago, and I had this overwhelming sense of, I have no idea where my food comes from. And I don't know why I even started thinking about that, what I had read that made me think about it. Uh, but it started concerning me a little bit, and, and so I started delving into it. And eating locally does a lot of things for a lot of people. First of all, it helps strengthen our community. So when we're eating locally, we're buying from local farmers, we're keeping those farmers in business, we're keeping our communities healthy. But eating local also means that your food doesn't have to travel so far to get to you, which mm -hmm. means it's fresher, it's healthier because it's not been sprayed up with pesticides and chemicals to preserve it for a two-week trip, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so it tastes better also because it's fresher. So it's really a win-win for everybody when we eat local. Um, it's just hard for some people to figure out how you do that. Fortunately, there are websites that show all the local farm CSAs that you can belong to, or there's farmers mm -hmm. markets. There's a lot of ways to figure that out today that maybe weren't so obvious a few years ago. Yeah, it seems like people are starting to wake up mm -hmm. to that. Yeah. You have a website. Yes. What can people find when they visit your website other than uh, eating local? Uh, so there's a section on the website about the cookbook, obviously. Mm -hmm. There's some featured recipes from the cookbook. There's some information about the contributors to the cookbook, mm -hmm. some history about putting the cookbook together that people can find there. Uh, but I also have two blogs on there. One is a food blog that features primarily recipes, but also cooking tips and techniques, uh, restaurant reviews, wine information. And then I have a travel blog that, as you can guess, is very heavily focused on the food-oriented aspects of my travels. I travel quite a bit. I take people on culinary trips around the world. So there's a lot on the, the uh, travel blog as well. And then there's a bunch of different resources. There's links to other food bloggers. There's food photography tips. There's um, different resources for local sources, all those kinds of things. And as you mentioned, today is your seven-year blogiversary. Yes, it is. So happy blogiversary. I think in dog years that might be 100, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or blog it might, years. <laughs> it might feel like it. Yeah. Uh, can we get any of your wonderful recipes whenever we go to your website or blog? Yes, yeah, so all the recipes are there, and there's a print button, and you can print them all off. Oh, wonderful, because yes. I'm going to get that chili recipe. I'm yes, gonna that's there. Them. Excellent. I'm so glad. Um, and so let's talk. Do you have a next project in the works? Will you write another cookbook? I actually just turned my manuscript in for my second cookbook, same theme but a different state. So uh, the publisher has been very happy with the success of this book and asked me to do Washington State, wow. which was really fun to do. I went up to Seattle in the fall and worked on that book. Um, and it's a completely different ingredient set. So there are things with oysters and octopus and gooey duck clams and all sorts of things that we don't see here in Colorado very much. And then a lot of things that we might see here but happen to be very uh, prolific up there, like uh, apples and mushrooms and 
uh, grains, lentils and things that are grown there. How so fun. it was fun to do that book and turn it in and uh, we're just working on the design and layout of that now it should be out in the fall. Wow, and uh, just like you said, a very different, different palette, very different, different set of yeah. ingredients. Uh, Michelle, thank you so much for coming on the show and talking with us about your cookbook and about bringing us samples. We just, I really love that. Wonderful food. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks for having me. You bet. I'd like to thank my author, Michelle Morris, for being on the show and talking about her book, Tasting Colorado. Check your local library for the books that we've talked about on today's show and join us more for next time on Off the Page.